Um, so welcome to the JK Friday seminar. First, I would like to thank Tim to uh, have been managing uh, the seminar when I was away. And um, so uh, Vlad volunteered in very short notice to uh, fill in for uh, Wayne, that is in the IAPC in Chile. Um, so Wayne was supposed to give a seminar, I think it's going to be one maybe next um, So um, Vlad um, is known as Vlad One. <laughs> um, and um, that too, <laughs> um, he's a chemical engineer and a mining engineer. Uh, he started his PhD in 2007 at the JKMRC. Um, and the PhD topic was effect of microwave heating on ore sorting, and it was funded by Rio Tinto. Uh, then in 2012, he, uh, he uh, submitted his PhD and then worked for the Rio Tinto Center for, um, Center for Advanced Minerals. So thank you, Vlad, um, and um, I'll be welcome. Thank you, Vlad, and um, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I hope this uh, topic will be interesting for you, uh, because it introduces uh, microwave technology into the mining industry, which we don't see often. So. I'll start with uh, a little bit of history. Um, pretty much everything started in, uh, uh, after the Second World War uh, when the British discovered the radar. And um, at that time, uh, uh, that was a time when we had actually a lot of uh, technological advances. And uh, uh, Percy Spencer uh, was experimenting with a new vacuum tube called Megatron. It was all at that time, it was all about radar, radars and how we can improve them. And um, he was doing this research for Rayton Corporation. Uh, while doing his experiments, uh, he noticed that uh, his uh, chocolate bar started to melt. And uh, he was intrigued. And he did another experiment with the corn. And when the corn started to pop, he, was, uh, uh, he said, well, hold on. This is something useful. This is something definitely I can use. And uh, later on, uh, remarkably only two years later, um, the Redden Corporation actually built the first uh, microwave oven. So where do we use microwaves? First of all, uh, I'd like to tell you that microwaves are pretty much all around us. Even in this room that we sit, on the ceilings we have uh, Wi-Fi, um, uh, routers, but uh, we, we, the most common application is actually microwave ovens that we use. Uh, and we can see we use also uh, with phones, with communications, uh, uh, we use for radio telescope for astronomy to study the uh, solar systems. Uh, we also use uh, in the radar a surveillance system, which is the original uh, application. Uh, and um, uh, we also use in GPS positioning system, uh, even nowadays, uh, medicine to uh, target uh, specific tumors. And um, we can see that microwave technology is uh, slowly uh, um, being introduced uh, in the uh, mining industry as well. So, what are microwaves? Well, microwaves are part of radio waves, and radio waves are part of electromagnetic waves. And uh, electromagnetic waves are spread uh, by interaction of electric field and magnetic field. And uh, they can be spread through vacuum and uh, different uh, dielectrics. It has two components. Uh, it has um, uh, wavelength and uh, frequency. So the wavelength, if, if we actually talk about sinusoidal wave, would be the distance between two tops and the frequency would be how many those waves we actually have in a second. So that's, that would be a simple explanation. Um, it also, we have that uh, the speed of, uh, or velocity of electromagnetic uh, uh, wave is approximately uh, 300 kilometers. And then if you choose a different frequencies, we will have corresponding um, wavelength. And, um, uh, electromagnetic waves are called differently depending on their uh, uh, frequency. 
and they're also used uh, in uh, uh, various applications. Uh, so radio waves which have frequency from 300 megahertz up to 300 gigahertz uh, or the wavelengths from one meter to one millimeter um, are pretty much known as uh, microwaves. So this is the region over here and uh, we can see uh, that uh, they belong to ultra high frequency, super high frequency and extremely high frequencies. And uh, they are used, as I said earlier, to read the system, even, even television, there was a huge difference. You all, you all remember when we moved from analog TV in, uh, to the digital one, and this is why we were able to actually get a high definition picture and improvement in, in, in the signal as well. Um, but when we use microwaves, it's all about frequencies. So certain frequencies are reserved for uh, certain things. And in the days where we want always to be connected, especially with our phones, and um, it is important um, uh, not to have interference, especially with uh, telecommunications. So certain frequencies are reserved uh, for telecommunications, and uh, there are laws which prevent interfering with those uh, frequencies. Uh, however, we also have uh, certain frequencies which are called ISM frequencies, uh, it stands for industrial science and uh, technical, and they are used for research and uh, other purposes. Uh, now, International Electrotechnical Commission defines microwave heating uh, to heat the electric materials through mainly their molecular motion and their ionic conduction by the action of uh, electromagnetic waves in the region of 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. Um, when a permanent electric dipole in um, the electric material follows the oscillation of uh, microwave field, uh, there is a slight delay, well, this phase delay. And this phase delay is resistant to the change of uh, microwave field. The, the electric materials is then heated uh, by this resistance. So the permanent electric vehicle is forced to vibrate while resisting and it generates the heat uh, by this action. To explain this a little bit, it's, it's better to use a visual uh, picture. So I'll explain this on the water, which is, we all know, very responsive to when we place in a microwave, it, it heats up very quickly. So we have a permanent dipole, which means we have positive end and a negative end. And while this uh, electromagnetic uh, wave is changing, and if we use the frequency of 2.5 gigahertz, that means that this dipole will try to follow the uh, changes within the electromagnetic field 2.5 billion times in a second, which is pretty fast. Um, and uh, this is the, as I said, image we can see uh, that delay as well. Now, what is important to say here as well is the power. And we all know, even when we use domestic microwave oven, we have different settings for different things. So, you know, for a huge chicken, we have one setting. For uh, popcorn, we have different. <coughs> so, uh, the power actually allows us to measure how rapidly we can heat our materials or the, uh, to calculate heat rate. Uh, of course, um, when we talk about uh, electromagnetic field, we always talk about electric component and magnetic component. So this power actually, or the energy comes both from electric component and magnetic component. For these uh, calculations, I was, uh, uh, here it's only shown for electric uh, component, but whatever is stated here for electric, uh, it is, we can repeat for magnetic. So the overall power, it has electric and magnetic component. And we also know uh, that this power is actually a function of uh, the electric uh, properties, the electric properties of material and the strength of the electric field within that material. And we also know uh, that we can measure this uh, temperature change within a time, uh, also by knowing uh, mass and uh, specific uh, uh, heat. So if we combine these two equations, uh, we can um, have an estimate of heating uh, rate of uh, this material. Now, the electric properties uh, of materials uh, are described by complex uh, permittivity. And uh, it is uh, complex permittivity, 
sorry, is a measure uh, of the ability of the electric to absorb and store uh, electrical potential energy. And it has its uh, real uh, part and the imaginary part. Now, the real component of the real permittivity uh, characterizes the penetration of microwaves into the material, while the, um, the imaginary uh, it, uh, indicates the material's ability to store the energy. Um, usually, we like to combine uh, these uh, two properties into one, and the ratio of them is called uh, loss factor or uh, loss tendency. Uh, and <coughs> we try to use uh, this value to somehow group materials. So, in 1954, uh, Von Hippel tried to do exactly that. He, he said, well, okay, we have microwaves, let's try to group certain materials, uh, whether they are responding really well to microwaves uh, or they don't. So we can see on this side, uh, and he tried to uh, do this by uh, commenting on the depth of penetration uh, and uh, relative permittivity and at the end uh, the, the electric loss factor. So we can see that on the right side here we have water, methyl alcohol, clays, ethyl alcohol, which respond really well. And we also see that the depth of penetration for these materials are really small, within the centimeters uh, or even uh, millimeters over there. But when we actually move on the left side, we can find quartz, we can find teflon, we can uh, find polystyrene. Uh, and we can see that for these materials, the penetration depth is much larger within the meters. Uh, so we can easily see that uh, certain material, uh, certain materials uh, react differently to, to microwaves. Now, this penetration uh, depth, or uh, it's important because um, if you use, it allows us to selectively heat and. Uh, uh, there are two frequencies which are using, usually used for um, scientific research. Uh, it's 915 megahertz and 2.5 uh, gigahertz. And we can see uh, if we have a lower frequency, uh, our wavelength is uh, uh, larger. So therefore, we can penetrate within this material much uh, more. Uh, and if you have different materials, uh, we can see that uh, that penetration depth is uh, uh, influenced by the properties of these two materials. Uh, and to explain this effect, uh, I will compare the standard uh, way of how we heat water within the container. Uh, the standard way would be uh, having a heating element on the bottom. Uh, and we can see that the uh, heat is gradually going from the heating element uh, upwards. Uh, but when we compare to microwaves, we can see that uh, it's almost volumetric because uh, this water is surrounded by microwaves from all around. Uh, but we still see that uh, there is a, a colder spot um, within uh, inside of the water, and this is because of this uh, penetration depth. So that means that. Uh, uh, microwaves can only reach to a certain level and then later on the heat is uh, transferred through conduction or convection um, uh, within the depth of uh, that material. So this is just a formula here and we can see it, it is usually defined as a distance from uh, the surface uh, of the material at which power drops uh, to around um, uh, 40%. Now, uh, we can also see here uh, that uh, we have different penetration depth for different temperatures. So, for example, water on the 25 degrees has 1.4 uh, centimeters uh, penetration depth, while at almost the boiling point it's 5.7 centimeters. But when we change, uh, when we look at water as ice, we can see that penetration depth goes almost to 1.1 uh, kilometer. And we also see here that for Teflon it's uh, 9.2 kilometers, but for example for meat and mashed potato, peas and all of that, we can see that penetration depth is uh, really small. 
So just to summarize about uh, microwave heating, uh, we can consider it as internal heating. Um, it is rapid heating. Uh, we can uh, have um, uh, high heating efficiency, uh, and we all witness this when we place uh, our coffees in microwave ovens and we can heat them up pretty much within 10 or 12 seconds. Um, we can also have rapid response and temperature control. And uh, compared to some other uh, energies, uh, it's, it's considered to be clean ener energy, so we don't have uh, uh, fuel residues or uh, other contaminants. Um, now, I would like to spend some time here to um, explain how the uh, microbe actually, uh, how the whole apparatus works uh, when we want to use microwaves to heat uh, 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 certain materials. And as, as we can see, uh, there is a lot of component. So I'll start with the microwave generator. Uh, within every microwave generator, we have Megatron. And Megatron is the main source of uh, microwaves. Uh, it emits, uh, it radiates uh, waves through these nozzles and they are transferred through waveguides uh, to applicator. Now, waveguides, uh, their purpose is solely to transfer microwaves from the generator to whatever we want them. And mostly we want them to end up in the applicator. Uh, just before we go to the power monitor we, where we, we can monitor forward power and um, reflected power, uh, we have isolator. <coughs> and the uh, uh, function of the isolator is to, pr to protect uh, a megatron <coughs> from overheating. Um, because some of the micro, uh, uh, microwaves will go to the applicator, but will have that uh, uh, small portion coming back. And these uh, reflected waves are um, absorbed by this uh, isolator. Um, so we're monitoring uh, uh, power in order to see how much uh, we're able to deliver power to the uh, load. And uh, before uh, applicator, we use tuner. Uh, tuners are used to create uh, the same level of um, waves with a different phase to minimize the reflected power. And when we minimize the reflected power, uh, we achieve the maximum uh, applied power uh, uh, within the cavity. And that process is called uh, matching. Uh, also, within the applicator, we have steers and turntables. The functional steers are to pretty much mix and enable uh, creating more modes and therefore creating more unified uh, electric field within the cavity and the functions of turntables are to achieve similar effect but actually turning the load instead of uh, 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 steers. Um, so, now, this, this article um, was published in The Economist and um, I'm showing it here uh, because uh, it's, it's introducing uh, um, the new way of extracting valuable minerals which is um, using the microwaves to uh, liberate um, minerals. It was published in 2003 and um, uh, these are comments from uh, Professor uh, Sam Kingman from the University of the Nottingham. So I'll just read. This, uh, so the technique works because minerals respond differently to microwaves. Some, such as copper sulfide, absorb microwaves well and heat up fast when exposed to them. Others, such as quartz, are almost transparent to microwaves, so hardly heat up at all. This differential heating creates cracks in the rock, encouraging it to fall apart in its constituent grains. Of course, it is, it is not as simple as that. Each rock type requires a different microwave recipe, for there are many subtleties involved. The frequency, intensity, and timing of the microwaves used is crucial. Apply too little energy, or the wrong sort, and the grain boundaries will not crack. A 
apply too much and the properties of minerals may be changed in the ways that make them harder to pro process afterwards. So we can see here from his comment that uh, it's not so simple. We have to have a lot of um, uh, things working uh, together in order to achieve efficient uh, fractures uh, uses, using this uh, thermal uh, cracking. So, uh, what is this thermal stress that we try to use? Well, we can define it, uh, actually, it, it occurs when the thermal gradient causes uh, different parts of an object to expand by uh, different amounts. And as you can see in this picture, we have sections which are cold and uh, we have sections which are exposed to extreme uh, heat. Uh, to some point, this stress can exceed the strength of the material, causing a crack to form. If nothing stops uh, the crack uh, from propagating through the material, it will cause uh, uh, the object structure to, to fail. Now, uh, we can see this is actually the natural um, phenomenon. And uh, we can see here uh, rocks from Argentinian Andes influenced by uh, uh, thermal fracture uh, fatigue. Uh, but uh, the thermal fracture uh, is a special of the physics and uh, 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 ceramics industry uh, because in ceramics we try to avoid thermal fracture as much as we can. Uh, now, how can we use uh, this uh, thermal fracture uh, in our advantage? or actually how can we achieve microwave-assisted breakage? Well, there are a couple of processes involved. So we have a microwave heating uh, of the responsive mineral phase. We have transient heat conduction during heating process between minerals. And uh, we have the transition of peak temperatures and thermally induced stress and strains. So in, con in um, conventional uh, combination, we usually achieve intergranular and uh, transgranular um, fracture. So we can see if we see this grain over here that the fracture actually went through the grain and continued going uh, forward. But with perfect intergranular fractures, which we are hoping to achieve with this uh, micro-assisted breakage, uh, we want to actually achieve liberation of this grain by creating perfect integral uh, fracture. Now, to achieve that, we have to know our minerals. We have to know our uh, properties of minerals. And um, we have to actually know thermal properties and the electric properties of our minerals. So we can see that different minerals have a different uh, thermal conductivity. For example, quartzite actually conducts heat uh, very well. And we also see that there is a, um, a difference in specific uh, heat capacity, which actually tells us how much we can store energy within that uh, material. So if, 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 if mineral can store more energy, that means it takes longer time uh, uh, to heat up. And that, therefore, uh, the difference between uh, uh, minerals um, in, in, in uh, their heating ratios can be achieved. Uh, so we also uh, have to know the electric properties of minerals and uh, as I showed previously with uh, water and uh, some other minerals uh, we have the same effect uh, here uh, especially with the temperature because uh, the electric properties of minerals are function of uh, temperature and they are also function of uh, frequency that uh, we use. So we can see here there are lots of factors that we have to take into account before uh, we can achieve efficient uh, microwave uh, breakage. Now Chen uh, in uh, uh, 1984 tried to group um, uh, these minerals, uh, 
pretty much similar to von Hippel in uh, 54, uh, in three different groups, minerals uh, uh, which are uh, not responsive uh, to microbes or very little responsive, uh, somewhat responsive and uh, uh, rapidly responsive. And we can see that um, most uh, sulfides such as charcoal pyrite, uh, pyrite, uh, pyrohotite and um, uh, 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 all the other copper bearing sulfides are very responsive <coughs> to uh, microbes compared to uh, most common game minerals such as calcite, dolomite, uh, quartz, uh, potassium feldspar. So usually um, we develop this term uh, calling uh, all these game minerals as matrix and um, all the sulfide minerals, spe specifically copper bearing sulfides as a mineral of uh, our interest. So what we are trying is to actually liberate uh, uh, or create as much as fracture around of our mineral of interest by uh, using microwaves. Now, uh, I will show you some uh, experimental work which involves um, uh, selective heating and um, uh, microwave uh, assisted breakage. Uh, I will, if you can, yeah, just turn the light so you can see better. And while the movie is going, I'll try to comment. before I start. So we will have uh, particles coming uh, from this side. So they are fed. Uh, so this is a, a waveguide applicator uh, and uh, we, we have here this circle over here is a particle positioning system which will receive the particles and take them out of the applicator. And particles are coming from the left side um, and uh, then uh, we'll see how they are uh, heated. So we can see particle here, and uh, we can see how microbes are really efficient uh, uh, heating up. We can see this selective heating forming. And Uh, we can see that for certain particles uh, we'll have uh, uh, different responses. For example, for this one, we can see that there is some mineralization here and here. And we can see it's, it's heating really fast. Is that real time? Yes, yeah, that's, that's the real time. That's the real time. Now, for this one, we can see forming really quickly, really fast. And uh, we can see that uh, the particles, uh, that the particle actually has shattered, uh, caused by uh, thermal stress. Actually, I can show this in uh, slower motion. So we see particle falling, and we can immediately see that there are certain parts within the volume of uh, this particle rapidly heating compared to some which really stay uh, cold. And uh, we can see that this thermal gradient is spreading really quickly, but certain parts of particles are still uh, staying really cold. And this is the moment when we actually achieved this fracture, thermal fracture. Okay, so I'll speed this up again. Okay, it's going to go. Uh, let's see some other ones. For example, for this one, 
we can even see the boundaries between two mineral phases and the uh, sulfide was pretty much in the middle and we can see the different heat patterns going from one side to the other so this is uh, the selective heating where we can see how sulfides are heating much faster compared uh, to uh, quartz for example here we can see that if the mineralization was uh, um, straight on the surface it heats up almost instantly <coughs> for this one uh, well we can see that this particle is non-responsive or there is something going on here but not, not sufficient to create any cracks or anything for the following we can see that same effect here a lot of heating and another successful breakage and we can see there are lots of fragments, different sizes uh, let's just watch the video okay, so I'm just going to yeah, so I'll just briefly comment here because uh, I actually extracted the frames where uh, for these two specific particles we managed to achieve uh, breakage um, so we can see the differential heating here and uh, the end result same here for the particle which was cold heated up extremely and again uh, broken apart now, uh, I would like to talk about a um, paper that I actually published in uh, 2011 uh, and uh, it is the effect of a pre pre treatment, uh, micro pre-treatment on the impact breakage of copper ore. So we also saw that uh, microwaves can be efficient in achieving this thermal breakage uh, and I was uh, interested in uh, to see uh, how if we treat uh, particles in this way uh, what the effect we can uh, see uh, when uh, uh, we have input breakage and um, the experiments which I showed you used continuous uh, microwave uh, power and for this uh, experimental work I was trying to uh, see the influence of modulated microwave power and um, this approach to power dealer uh, to certain whether the strength of copper copper ore can be reduced with uh, lower average uh, uh, modulated power level than using continuous power um, also changes in resistance to break uh, breakage of the treated and untreated ore were quantified by uh, comparative drop weight tests. Uh, I used um, MLA to um, pretty much quantify uh, uh, minerals and identify minerals, and I used uh, tomography to investigate uh, texture of the minerals. Now, I have to explain what's, I'll briefly explain what's modulation. So, uh, if you consider the scale waveform uh, with the value of, uh, with the minimum value and the maximum value in, the, in a duty cycle, uh, we can see that uh, in a time, um, if we actually uh, use this for power, uh, we'll see that in a certain amount of time uh, the power is actually oscillating uh, for a certain amount of time between its minimum and uh, maximum uh, value and uh, uh, we can see here the formula which is used to calculate the average uh, power used uh, as I said, ex 
experiment was done uh, with the applicator, uh, as I said earlier. So this is this is the applicator. I had particles placed inside of the waveguide uh, to achieve the uh, maximum efficiency of the power delivery. And I used the standard uh, JKMRC drop weight testing device to investigate the impact uh, breakage. Now, I also have to uh, comment about um, mineralogy, about this uh, porphyry uh, ore. And as we can see here, um, there are some large uh, grain of, of uh, charcoal pyrite, which we see that it can react really uh, well to microwaves. And um, here, I don't know if you can see because of the contrast, but the grain is pretty much within this red circle. And you can see it has a large uh, surface. Uh, there is a large surface between sulfide and the quartz. So a majority of uh, gang minerals in this case were quartz and calcite. In, and we can see that uh, this is one texture. Pretty much we have large grain sizes embedded within uh, quartz and, and calcite uh, matrix. In, in this case, matrix is more calcite, uh, but we have uh, andradite and uh, some pyrite uh, dispersed around the whole volume of the particle. So we can see uh, surface analysis actually tells us that uh, there is uh, uh, small grains disturbed, uh, dispersed everywhere, but this is actually happening to the whole volume uh, of this particle. And the last uh, case is where we have, again, uh, mostly uh, quartzite and K-Feldspar matrix. And uh, we have pyrite uh, uh, as very small um, dispersed. But the distance between uh, this grain size is much larger compared to these ones. So this is important. So we need to have this sort of information to see and assess whether this uh, ore type will be amenable to microwave treatment or, or not. As more information we have, uh, uh, we can assess that uh, more easily. Now, as I said earlier, uh, I had uh, three different uh, power levels that I was trying to achieve. Uh, so the minimum power was kept uh, at uh, uh, 600 watts, while the maximum power uh, was changed from 1 kilowatt to 5 kilowatt. And when we actually uh, calculated uh, to average applied modulated power, uh, we can say that uh, 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 samples were treated with uh, uh, 800 watts, 1.8 kilowatt, and 2.8 uh, kilowatts. And the exposure time was uh, five seconds, which was much less than you saw in the movies because that was 12 seconds. So uh, for material treated with uh, five kilos, as I said, uh, when we take uh, simple uh, uh, calculations for five seconds, assuming one kilogram in the cavity, uh, we can see that uh, there was an input of 6.94 kilowatts uh, uh, hours per ton. Uh, and um, for the modulated, uh, we can see that that power has uh, uh, reduced to 3.89 kilowatts. Uh, so here we can see uh, all four drop weight tests. I kept uh, one um, drop weight test uh, uh, which was not uh, treated. All drop weight tests were representatively uh, split so that we get that, that we have a representative uh, sample and uh, later on um, I had to make uh, certain adjustments uh, to uh, sizes which are used uh, from standard droplet tests so uh, I haven't uh, used the largest size uh, and I introduced uh, some smaller sizes uh, now For this particular ore type, uh, the mineralogical investigation showed that uh, this uh, porphyry copper has potential 
for reduction in stress by uh, microwave treatment. Uh, it also showed that a change in the strength of sample exposed to microwave in the applicator relates to applied microwave power level. Uh, but comparative drop fed tests showed that uh, material treated for 5 seconds at 5 kilo uh, modulated power uh, is easier to break than untreated material and that for more evident difference uh, in the strength of ore fragments, higher modulated power than 5 uh, kilo must be used. But there is a catch. Um, if you actually, I'll just go back. So the minimum energy which I used was 0.5. Okay, and if you can see, this blue line is the uh, sample which was treated with the highest uh, microbe energy. Uh, all the other ones are uh, below that. So. To achieve, uh, for, for the increase in, in, in T10 values, for the minimum uh, uh, energy, uh, between untreated ore and tested ore, there was only 4%. And for this 4% uh, increase in, in T values, T10 values, we applied 3.89 uh, kilowatts hour uh, per ton of modulated micro energy. The same increase of T10 can be achieved with increase of conventional combination energy just by increasing 0.1 kilowatt um, uh, hours per ton. Uh, it is possible that uh, using much higher microwave power levels in, that, uh, in this testing, we will get much better liberation results uh, with modulated power than uh, using conventional methods of uh, breakage. Well, pretty much, uh, as I said, we, we have to find that sweet spot. First of all, we have to find that sweet spot uh, for uh, ore to be responsive. And then later on, we have to find the spot, a sweet spot uh, uh, to wait whether the amount of energy that we invest through microwaves is actually um, enough to uh, uh, enhance our breakage. Uh, and the uh, liberation. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> or is it turning out to be too difficult to implement? Well, um, I guess this uh, technology, uh, well, when the whole mining industry, you know, things are moving really slowly. Certain things have to go 20 years, 50 years. Uh, so when we take uh, this introduction of microwaves into mining, uh, most things have been happening uh, recently, so in the past, let's say, 15 years. So I'm thinking uh, there still needs to be more uh, investigation. Uh, there are certain companies which are working uh, to, to uh, uh, study this technology uh, much better and, and, and to achieve this uh, high throughout output. Uh, but as I said, uh, it is still, uh, as I can say, an experimental phase. What was the mineral content uh, of the samples that, that broke with the high intensity? Uh, well, it was, uh, as I said, the sample which I showed you to break, uh, I can't discuss because I'm still under but um, let's say it, it, it has sufficient uh, amount of minerals uh, that, as you, as you saw, uh, that it can achieve that uh, fracture. So. so it seemed like it had the highest intensity at the completion of breakage. So I'd suggest that there's a lot of mineral content that's on the surface area. Oh, uh, yeah.
Yep. Um, and then you just say TV break, <coughs> up to three minutes. Well, as I said, uh, when I was doing this, there, there are certain things that uh, I can publish at that time. And uh, uh, I can comment still uh, that, uh, as I said, on, from the point of input breakage, uh, there were uh, some improvements, uh, especially the highest power. Uh, but when we take account of how much energy was taken, uh, yeah, well, we, we can debate whether it was worth worthwhile to do that. Now, liberation, as I said, uh, all later on samples were saved and we tried to achieve this liberation narrative, but I can't comment on that because we were. Do you think there's potential to use low power microwaves in combination with thermal imaging to do online assessment of the ability of neurology? So don't try to break it at all, but just apply a bit of microwave power, heat it up a bit, and get an idea of whether it was that coming through or a lot of mineral content or not. Well, uh, my thesis will uh, be taken out of ice in. September 2015, so you're welcome to read it. <laughs> <coughs> Which explain exactly that. Um, that, that's very, very good work. Um, I think it highlights one one thing that we need to look at at the JK of us here, and that's, that's a, um, and I wish Frank was here, um, but there was a way of um, measuring pre weekly we need to be consistent about the way we, we measure pre-weakening. Um, and and there's, there's a couple of projects going on around the place about how we actually measure the, um, the competence decrease that, that happens with some kind of technology, whether it's microwave or... Um, well, I, I, could, I like completely that. agree with you. And, and uh, there was actually other paper which I presented in Palmer. It actually uh, investigated improvements in flotation uh, after the treatment as well. And you can associate that with liberation staple. So uh, that, that paper is also available. Uh, and it was commenting about using CBT and, and uh, combined tomography and textures and uh, whether there were benefits or not. Uh, but uh, I, I completely agree with you. If we can manage it, you know, use those meta methodologies, then we can uh, comment upon whether certain things are more efficient than the others. So, because I, I, I don't think from the T10 ECS graphs that you put up that you can make any conclusions about the effect effectiveness of, of microwave free treatment. Um, we need to have a better way of measuring. As I said, the comment was on the impact breakage, you know, which you can. I mean, the impact breakage, uh, we use drop uh, test to assess. And, and uh, as I said, uh, at that time, that was the, the only thing I could publish. Is there, is there an opportunity to use the technology even further upstream? So, looking at mining, so if you're mining, you can microwave this one in situ as you mine. Uh, I'm really glad that you asked that question. Yes, yes, there are lots of projects now um, which are trying to. Uh, uh, create microwave drills. Uh, there's lots of things involved in uh, remote sensing. And um, I'm glad, especially at JK, I think we have to think uh, further, further in the future. Like, uh, microwaves are definitely something which will go more and more into mining industry. And if you're talking about mining um, on meteorites or uh, in the space, you know, how do you do gravity separation where there is no gravity or with a small gravity or when we can't use, you know, water to separate minerals? How do you achieve that liberation? You know, and all these microwaves actually using uh, electromagnetic waves will, I think, in my opinion, achieve that. So we're trying to push the boundaries as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't tried, but that would definitely be interesting to, to 
see and, and maybe one of the other projects. Maybe that's that's good actually for community group to start investigating. Yeah.